So when you think of the entirety of the scripture, what is the central theme that comes to mind? Well, what, whether you're zoomed out in a bird's eye view, looking at, looking at it from above, or you're, you're, you're trenched in in a particular, a particular passage, the reoccurring theme that we see in, in the scripture is God's saving design through the covenant of grace which is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And we also see our response to that covenant, our response to the grace of God. And this passage that I, I've been assigned to this morning clearly demonstrates that. Before we get into that, I'm going to do a little, little bit of background work. So the book of Genesis begins with what scholars would call the primeval history, right? And that's essentially the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Prior to getting to, to chapter 12, we have the whole creation story in Genesis 1 and 2. And then we have in, in Genesis 3, the fall of man and, and how God curses man. And soon after, we have a series of events which show mankind spiraling down, right? We have the account of Cain, killing his brother Abel. We have the corruption of mankind in Genesis 6, and this leads to God flooding the earth. And then in Genesis 11, we, have, we see man trying to build a tower. And what, is he, what, is, what is man trying to accomplish here? They're trying, to, they're trying to make their name great. They're trying to make a name for themselves. And in, in essence, uh, they're building this tower uh, and, and becoming idolaters. And situated in, in Genesis 12 is a bridge that helps us to see how God redeems a corrupt people through the obedient faith of one man after the scattering of Babylon. So with this passage, the focus of the book narrows down. It goes from the wider creation and the whole story of creation and the fall, and it hones in to, to, the, to, to one family, and that's the family of Abram. I'm going to be using Abraham and Abram interchangeably, um, but I'll try to stay with Abram. So this brings us to our portion of Scripture today. We start off with the family of, of Abraham, and, and, and that's what we're transitioning into in Genesis 12. And the word of God says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I'm going to be breaking up this portion of Scripture into two points. The first, first being in verse 1, God calls Abraham. And the second will be God's promise or God's covenant to Abraham and then Abraham's response. So before we see the response of Abraham, we, we first see the call, right? When we think of Abraham, what do we think of? We think of the father of, of faith. Or we may think of Abraham as one of the godly men that made it into Hebrews 11, the men of faith, right? But the book of Joshua gives us a, a bit of context of where he was situated before he was called. In Joshua 24, verses 2 and 3, it says, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan 
and multiplied his descendants to give him Isaac. So, so it says here that Terah, the father of Abraham, served other gods. And Abraham would have been very likely to follow in his footsteps. And we learn in Genesis 11 that we, we see the genealogy of, of Terah. So Abraham was living in an idolatrous land, a pagan land, and most likely living just like the pagan people. So despite what men think, and despite how highly men think of Abraham, or the Jews think of Abraham, he was, he was in darkness, and he needed to be called. And it was the sovereign hand of God that intervened in, in Abraham's life, calling him, not because he was special in and of, in and of himself, or because he had any righteousness of his own, but rather because it was the predetermined will of God. It was the decree of God to save Abraham. And God was pleased to, to, to do so, to save him. And it would bring glory to, to his name. And this is important because in, in verse 3, it says that, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And just as he is called, all his descendants will be called. He is called out of wickedness. And God does the initiating in terms of calling Abraham. And so it is with all his descendants. So it is always God doing the call. God is the one that calls a man out of his sin and into, into His grace, into His saving grace. And all men are unworthy of the calling that we are called. But it is God that makes us worthy when He calls us out of our wickedness and out of our sin. We are never called because we are righteous. Rather, we are righteous because we are called. We respond only to the calling because God, the Spirit of God, regenerates us to respond to the calling. And this is what we see in, in, in Abraham's calling, is, it is, is God regenerating and calling him to himself. Many texts, we have many proof texts or a text to, to, to back up the calling of God, the sovereign will of God, the sovereignty of God in salvation. And you guys are all familiar with it, but John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will, give, will come to me, and who, him who comes to me I will not cast out. John 6, 44, I have manifested my name to them whom thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them to me. And we can go on and on and on, but for the sake of time, I will continue. So we see God's, we, we, we see God's initi initiating of the call. And then God continues His call through a command. This, 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 command, this call was conditional. This covenant was conditional based off His response to the call. And it says that He ought to leave, to leave your country, right? That's the first thing that He calls Him to. And in verse 1, we see that God calls Abraham out of his country. And the first question is, where is he calling him to? And Abraham was being called out of the land of Ur. And what we know of Ur is that it, it was an extremely sophisticated city. And by Abraham's time, it was already founded many centuries before. So to, to hear the name of Ur would be like, would be like hearing New York City or London, or Japan, or Tokyo, a city that is well-established, a city that is iconic. So to leave the land of Ur would be a difficult thing to do. And we quickly begin to see that the command to Abraham would not be an easy one, and was not an easy one. Rather, the command would be one of sacrifice. And continue to take notice what, he's, what, what he is calling him from. 
And he says, and from your relatives. And to leave your relatives would mean to leave those whom you are loved by and those whom you love. And then he says, and, and from your father's house. So, so he's, he's hitting closer and closer to home as he's, he's calling Abraham. He goes from your country to your relative to your father's house. So Abraham is, is, is essentially being stripped of all human support. And notice the, the common word here, to leave your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. And the repetition of this word shows that God is calling Abraham to abandon self, to abandon his place of comfort, to abandon normal sources of security, and he calls him into a foreign land, an unknown land. He says, to the land which I will show you. And then we see where he's calling him to, to go into the land that he will show him, to go into a different land, an estranged land. It would be an unfamiliar land to Abraham. And so we see and we know that he's being called from the land of Ur. And we read a little bit, a couple of verses down, and we see that he's, that, that although Abraham doesn't know where he's being called to, we see that he's being called to the land of Canaan. So the call to Abraham was very clear on what he ought to leave. But it was not clear where he was going. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for, for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So... So we begin to see that Abraham must trust God in, in this calling. If he's going to respond to this calling, he must put his trust in God. He didn't know where he was going to go. So God was calling Abraham to obey, to trust God wholeheartedly. And to trust in, in, in His will. To trust in His will. Lastly, we see that Abraham is called from one place to another. So we see God's sovereign call, which He initiates, is not an easy call, and that it requires sacrifice of comfort and of ease. It requires total allegiance to Him. And though we may not fully know where the Lord may be leading us, and as Abraham didn't know, we must trust and we must depend on the will of God, on the sovereignty of God, on the goodness of God, to trust Him, to trust Him in where He is taking us, on what He wants to use us for. And this requires that, that we fully trust in God. This requires that we depend on Him, that we cling to Him, that we rely on Him. And we know that God doesn't simply call us from a pagan land to nothing. He, he's calling Abraham from a pagan and sinful and an idolatrous land, but he calls him into a glory, to the glorious light. He calls him to himself. He calls him to, to, to Canaan, which is a land flowing with honey. And brothers, he calls us out of our sin out of our wickedness, and He calls us into Himself. And we have eternal life, and we're, ex we're expectantly waiting to spend all eternity with Him. And this is the hope that we have, brothers. This is what we ought to look to, the promises of God. Hebrews 11.10 says, For He was looking for the city which has fountains, whose architect and builder is God. Not simply called to just an a earthly city, brothers. But we're just sojourning here on this, 
on this, in, in, in this lifetime to go into a, 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 a heavenly city, an eternal city. We move on to the next point, and it says God, and this is God's covenant to Abraham and Abraham's response. And in verse 2, what we're seeing is God making a covenant or a promise to Abraham. And what a glorious covenant this is. At the most basic level, covenant is an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. And Abraham's call was through a single command. But the covenant on behalf of God What we're seeing here and what we begin to see, it's much greater. It's much more glorious what God is going to do if he responds to this call. And it is the same same with us, brothers. God calls us out of our, our, our sin and he calls us into something much greater, much more glorious. Calls us into eternal life. He calls us to be, from, from being uh, uh, enslaved to sin and in the slave market of sin and to being a slave of Him. He begins to lay out the, 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 the promise, the covenant, the promises that He's going to give to Abraham. And he says, I will make you a great nation. This obviously in the immediate sense would be that he's going to expand the nation of Israel. But through the nation of Israel come the Gentiles. The, 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 the call is, goes out to the Gentiles. And this, this wasn't God's second plan. It was his plan from the foundations of the, from the, foundations of the earth. Amen. Was to call a people. To call those that are descendants of Abraham. And in Galatians 3, 4, it says, Therefore, be sure, it is those who are are of faith who are sons of Abraham. See, so we are the fulfillment of this call. It's not simply just Jews that that are his descendants, but it is those who have faith in God. Those who rely on God. In God, those who trust as Abraham trusted in God. And this may have seemed like a difficult thing for Abraham to do, especially since he didn't even have a son. How 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 would he he make a great nation if I don't even have a son? And then we read that he's 75 years old, so he's he's up up in in, in years to, to be having a son. And then he says, I will bless you and I will make your name great. And what he means by making his name great is that he would make his name known. And, not, and he didn't make his name known for Abraham's sake. Yes, we know Abraham. Yes, we're familiar with Abraham. But it always, whenever we're reading uh, scriptures that refer to Abraham, many times it, it says the God of Abraham. So to make... Abraham's name great really means to make God's name great, to use a person to to glorify himself, to honor himself, to exalt himself. And is that how you see yourself and the life that God has called you to? Yes, he will bless us. Yes, he may grow certain ministries through us. But it is not for us, it is for Him. It is for His glory. Amen. It should never be about us. Amen. And so it wasn't simply about Abraham. But that which would come through Abraham, the example that he put forth for his people, for his descendants. And then he says, I will bless those who bless you and I, and." And the one who curses you, I will curse. And so we see the Lord's protection as part of the promise. 
those who, 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 who bless you, he will bless. We, we, when, when we're blessed by other brothers, we really can't give them the, the blessing that they deserve, but God does. God sees and God blesses them. And when those who, those who come in opposition toward us and those who persecute us and come against us, the call is to leave it into God's hands. Let, let God take vengeance. So we see that though the, the call to Abraham requires much, what God gives in the fulfillment of the covenant does not compare to, to the sacrifice that Abraham had to make. And we continue to see that even in the promises, he had to trust God. Abraham must exchange the known for the unknown. He must find his reward in what he could not see. He wasn't going to be able to see this great nation come to fruition. He, he would not expect all of us being part of the nations and us being part of his descendants. He, would, he was to put his trust in what was intangible, thy name, and in what, and what, what he would impart. He said that he would bless him. So all these things he could not see, but he trusted. He relied. And then verse 4 says, we see the, the response. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Abraham. So we see the, the response of obedience. Abraham did not depend on what he felt. Does not, does not, he's not driven by his emotions. He hears the call of God and he follows. He obeys. And what, 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 what pushes him along, what propels him is the promises that are being made to him. They far outweigh the, 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 the sacrifice that we must make. And so what we see is Abraham is a great example for us today because we are called and the Lord Jesus Christ says that we must take up our cross and follow him and we must deny even our family. He must be first, top, priority in our lives and this call is is. When, when, he, when it is initiated, it, it is required of, of us, but it continues as we continue to, to follow Him. We, are, we, are, we should be continually having our eyes fixed on Him. Do you, is, is your allegiance for Christ? Are you living for Christ? Are you serving Him wholeheartedly? Are your affections for Him? This, this is what it must be, my brothers. Your affections must be on Christ and Christ alone. And what is going to propel us is the promises that He has made. That He will never leave us. That He will never forsake us. That He will be with us. That He has given us the Spirit to help us. And we look to the, 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 the culmination, the end, the final whether we go there or, or, or he comes here, as Paul Hosher says, we're going to go into to, to all eternity to spend worshiping with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if that doesn't propel you, my brothers, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. And so it is, it is the gospel that we must look to, my brothers. And be reminded of that glorious gospel. And I'll uh, just end us in prayer. And Lord, we just thank you. We praise you, O Lord, for your word. We praise you for the example of Abraham. And we pray, O Lord, that you would help us uh, to be faithful to the cause as he was faithful to the call. To be obedient, O Lord. Uh, to, to not lay hold of things that are here in this earth. Uh, that will diminish, uh, but to lay hold of, of treasures in heaven. Help us to look to you, to depend on you, to rely on you. 
and to trust in you, my God. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.